Can we take the lessons Jesus gave us and learn to be a leader? That's what we'll talk about today. Jesus made this absolutely plain. His chief characteristic of Christian leaders, he insisted, is humility, not authority, gentleness, not power. John Stott. Today we're going to talk about the book, Lead Like Jesus, Revisited, Lessons from the Greatest Leadership Role Model of All Time, by Ken Blanchard, Phil Hodges, and Phyllis Hendry. It asks a question about what it is we need to do to be a leader in this world, and how we can take people up to newer heights, but also bring them into a place where they can be led like Jesus leads us. And he says in a word, it's done through love. And it's not always easy to love people. And it's often very difficult. But when we learn that kind of love, to love other people, we'll learn how to lead like Jesus. Part of it too is we know that Jesus has a plan for us. And as a leader, you should have a plan for people. Jesus never saw a difference between being a servant and being a leader, that faith calls us to be both things. So the whole point of the book is to go through examples like this and others about how we can be a better leader to be a little bit more like Jesus. He says oftentimes we want to be a leader like Jesus, but sometimes we really don't want to. We say we want to, but we don't. We get mad at people. We want to shake things up. We want to sit in our office and make decisions and make them stick. But in the end, that's not how Jesus led. And so we oftentimes want to do it. We just don't. And they talk about Paul, of course, who said, you know, I don't do the things I hope to do. I say I'm going to do these things and I don't do them. And that is because in the end, I'm not perfect. And of course, they quote Paul because Paul also had the same frustration. He says that we try to be good Christians, but then maybe we're driving and cutting people off, that we're swearing at people we know, and we're not living the Christ-like life in our day-to-day works. And I remember at one point I was going to get one of these fish things and put them on my back of my car. And then you thought, Jill, you don't drive like you should have a fish thing on the back of your car. You would give Christianity a bad name by doing so. And that's what I started to try, to drive a little bit more kindly on the road. The book brings out this main point, which is you have to get your ego out. And ego stands for edging God out. Whenever we have an ego problem, the fundamental problem is we're edging God out. We know better. We think better. We have better authority. And we got to put God back in where we're trying to take him out. The book says that sometimes we edge God out by worshiping other things. We edge God out by looking at our self-worth instead of looking at how God looks at us. The quote from The Search of Significance by Robert S. McGee said, quote, if Satan had a formula for self-worth, it would be self-worth equals our performance plus our opinion of others. That's Satan's definition. That is not God's definition. That we have to start putting God back into the main point of our lives showing unconditional love and not talking about self-worth, but instead looking at God's worth to us and how God sees us. If we're looking at the ways that God sees us, we're taking out that ego part of it. We wrote our story before the foundations of the world. I think that God gives us talents and combinations of skills and ability And we're to use those things, but not in an egotistic way, but in a, I'm going to give the things that God gives me use and purpose in my life. And he quotes Matthew 12, 35, NLT. A good person produces good things from a treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from a treasury of an evil heart. We know there's all sorts of places in the Bible where it talks about fig trees or fruiting trees that don't produce fruit and that a good tree produces good fruit. It's just another one of those quotes where we can see the fruits of our labor. If the fruits of our labor is anger, frustration, tears, 
all the bad things that we're trying not to do, we know we're not working in a way that is godly. And the book talks about how pride is absolutely destructive. It tells people that you're better. You do all the talking. You're boasting. You're putting people down. You're treating people poorly. And it's not the right way to go. I always think about it and I try to think about it is, I am no better than the person who's next to me. God sees them as no better. God also sees them as no worse. So wherever position you're in, you are just a beloved child of God. And that is the end of it. And God loves you the same way he loves that person who's right next to you. Even if they don't believe in God, that person still is loved by God. And you should treat other people as loved beings from God too. The book talks then about fear and how fear brings us down. Because a lot of times I think that people react poorly or treat each other poorly purely out of fear. If they think that there's one promotion and if they don't get it, their family's not going to eat or won't have the things they need. Now they're afraid. And now it's not just about destroying that other person or doing anything to get that promotion or ripping, tearing down that other person so that you could get the job you want instead of that person getting the job. Any means to that end is important because if I don't do that, my family doesn't eat or my kids won't go to college. That fear can drive as many bad activities as pride or any of the other things. And when we have fear, we should know that God sees us for who we are. He already sees our weakest points. He knows what we're going through. Reminds me of that book. My heart is Christ's home where he's already here. He's living inside our heart. He knows what's in the bad closet. We won't show him. God knows these things. And so if we live in this fear, we should bring our fears to God so that he can help us with them. So he can give us the confidence and get us away for constantly feeling not only afraid, but feeling like we have to destroy the other person so that we can get beyond our fear. And then the book says sometimes we just get addicted. We get addicted to not just the things that people get addicted to, drugs and alcohol or power or video games or whatever it is they get addicted to, but they get addicted to more, to gaining more, to providing more to their families, to being the leader who edges everybody else out. And this problem of addiction makes it seem like We're unable to stop our activities at work, our bad activities as a leader by being self-centered, scared, prideful. We're addicted to it. And so we say, oh, I can't do anything about it. This is just who I am. No, you can do something about it. And we should. He says, too, that there's this other problem of the do-nothing boss. Never around, never helpful, never solves conflict, never does anything that a boss should be doing in order to make the workplace a better place. I have to tell you, I have had excellent arrays of bosses, people who were real servants. And the boss I have now, absolutely fantastic. He will stand up for his team. He will solve problems. If you go to him with a problem, he is there and steps in to make sure that this gets solved. It's really amazing to watch. And it's lucky when you see a human being like this, Because you see someone who takes their job seriously and tries not to just be a figurehead. And so what we have to do, he says in this book, is that we have to get more connected to God. When we're separated from God, we get that pride and that fear. We get ashamed and we don't bring things to God. We don't pray. We don't ask God questions. And we don't seek counseling, you know, from maybe a pastor or other elders in our church. We are just so driven that we couldn't possibly wait on God. They said another problem is when we become separated from people, which means we tear other people down, we reject their ideas, we don't help them, we're not the kind of leader who steps in for their workers, and we're afraid of losing control. And you can see that the problem is, is that everyone has a boss. And so if we have a boss that's not standing up for their team, It's because they're afraid 
if I go to bat for my team, my boss will think I'm not doing my job or my boss will think I'm spending too much money or my boss will think bad things for me. So that separates that boss from the other people because, again, either because they're prideful or they're too afraid. And then the third problem this book says is that we separate from ourselves. We're not taking criticism. We're not taking advice. We're not looking to the problems that we have. Instead, we're so busy solving everybody else's problems, and we're spending no time in prayer, reflection, or inner lookings to see what types of things we have to solve. So this whole ego problem that this book is talking about is basically what they said, ever since Cain slew Abel, been a problem of leadership of humanity since the very beginning. But that constant fear and pridefulness is going to cause us problems. Then the last part is, too, is a part of fear has to do with the fact that they quote Matthew 6, 19 through 21 about storing up treasures on earth where moss and vermin destroy. That's a hard one to do because, again, we think, I want to get a savings account. I want to save for my retirement. I want to make sure my kids go to college. I'm you know, thinking of all the things that I'm saving up for. But we have to realize that it is that eternal look at things, the treasure of heaven that matters the most. If we're looking only at those treasures of earth, we're going to be disappointed. Houses crash. We lose our things. Maybe we lose our house or maybe we even lose our health. These are treasures on earth. But once we focus on the treasures of heaven, we can see the bigger picture. The thing that God has for us, not just now, not just in 10 years, but for all eternity. And that's when we have to realize that leading other people has to do with helping them with the things that will not decay, the treasures of heaven. And that we always have to suppress that voice, he says, that begins with the word I. I remember listening to this politician. I'm like, something is wrong with this speech. It's wrong. The speech is wrong. And so I listened to a bunch of people the next day and they indicated that he said the I word like 282 times in the speech. Where's the we? Where's the vision for the people? Where's the vision for everyone around him? I, 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 I. And if we do that, I have to do this. I have to get this done. I have to work long hours. I have to provide for my family. And if you're going down that direction of what they call the self-serving leader, you're going about it all wrong. And you're just going to hurt not just yourself, but everyone around you. And then comes the next problem that we think everything's on our shoulders too. So not only are we robbing everyone else of the ability to be a part of the problem solving, we're putting the weight of everything on our shoulders And then it makes us cranky. We're cranky at our family and our friends. I don't have time to deal with that. I don't have time to do with anything with you. And you start smacking out at other people. It's a negative reaction to everyone around you. And then people will not want to be around you because not only are you kind of an arrogant jerk, but now you feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulder and you don't have time for them. So a leader of Christ is not going to be that self-centered way because you're going to bring people in, you're going to make them feel loved, you're going to make them feel a part of the solution. I always think about that. God in the Bible could have solved all the problems, and yet he puts us in as part of the solution. He uses very faulty people in very high positions and makes them part of the solution. It's amazing, and that's what leadership is about. So once we choose God, and we get away from our ego, then our self-worth will be in the right place. Our thoughts and wisdom will be in the right place. God will be our authority, and so we will go to him with prayer, which the book says will give us confidence and humility, will allow us to have those relationships with other people because God's love is at the center of everything. We will study the scripture so that we know what it is we're supposed to be doing. And this was the last step. And it reminds me of that podcast I did a while ago in episode 10 and 11 about quietness. The book Stilte, The Dutch Approach of Silence. 
but can we have solitude with God, with the scripture, so that we can step back a little bit, know that we're loved, think about God's word, and let that practice lead us back into God's path so that we now are no longer thinking of all the I, 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 but instead we're thinking about God's leadership and not just our own. You mentioned in the book that every time God had an insurmountable situation, what did he do? He went and brought himself in the audience of God. He brought himself away from people. He brought himself out to the Olive Garden. He went into the mountains. He sought solitude with God in order to gain that connection with God. And it so noisy in this world and there's so many things going on and we're so busy all the time. I think that book, if you listen to the episode or read the book, it's good steps about regaining that solitude and gaining that connection to God we so desperately need in such a loud and boisterous world. And he says that when we're reading the Bible, we should take all the passages that talk about God and what he thinks of us and the relationship and put in our name. Jill, I know you by name. Jill, I loved you with an everlasting love. Jill, I gave my life for you. And he keeps going on that when you see these promises of God, put your name in there so that you understand this isn't a general, I will wipe away every tear. It's not. It's Bob. I will wipe away every tear from your eye. That's what we're looking for. And we can get that by gaining that solitude that we have with God and his message. At the end of the book, then they give this, just suppose I put aside my doubts. Just suppose I said a prayer. Just suppose I lived each day. I remember at the end of the book, Wild, which is not an example of a biblical book, but she says, what if? What if I just stopped doing this bad thing? What if I just started living my life the way I should be? Just suppose is that same kind of phrase. What if I just did it? What if I just started praying every day? What if I just started knowing every day God loves me fully? And they give suggestions that we can confess our sins, that that will release us when we fall short, that we give thanksgiving and thank God for all the things that he's done for us. At the end, he gives this other type of a practical work step to getting back into the message of God, where they say, hear the word of God, read the word of God, study the word of God. And then the last one, memorize the word of God and meditate on the word of God. And then make sure you spend time reflecting on that. Long time ago, I started a program with a friend of mine where we called it the RPM method, read, pray, meditate. And we wanted people every week to do those three things. I think that that was in the nutshell of all of this, except they also had memorized, which is another good thing. But every time you should bring yourself into the study of God's word, because it'll tell you not only what God expects of you, but what God promises to you how God expects you to lead and treat other people. And we get that way from hearing the word of God, reading the word of God, studying the word of God. Then the part where we meditate, the RPM, the meditate part, we're going to throw it over in our mind. We're going to ruminate on it. We're going to think about it a lot. And then it talks about pause and reflection. In my P, I had prayer, but that's part of the pause and reflection. Now that you've learned something new, what can you do? How can you talk to God about it so that you can do better? This part about the memorize, I think, is always very good. I never was really encouraged to memorize bits of the Bible, although people who go to my church and went through the Sunday school process as children were encouraged to memorize the scripture of God. And I think the thing that's good about it is I noticed that when my friends get into times they have a bunch of passages memorized. So even when they were talking to me about Jesus, I would say, well, what about this? And they'd say, well, God said, and they would have it fully memorized. It's good that if you get into a situation where maybe you don't have a Bible at your hand, you're put on a desert island, you have some passages memorized that can help you in any situation you have. 
And if it's memorized, it's at the fingertip that you can pull it out anytime you need to use it. Whether you're in a debate with someone, whether you're a leader and you're wondering what is the right way to go, or you're stuck on that desert island, memorizing passages will always be there to help you. And the end of the book uh, talks a lot about the future you. My other podcast, Start With Small Steps, I talked about the future you, but finding what your core values are, finding what your purpose, your message is, and then creating a vision for your leadership. What is it you're trying to get done? What is it you're trying to do? What are the values you're trying to go with in your life? Not just about your business and how much profit you want to make next year and how much those things are part of your job for sure if you are a leader. But isn't it also part of your job to love God and love your neighbor, love other people? So by doing a vision for your job and for your life, it's going to bring you back to the part that is the important part of leadership which is being a follower of Jesus and loving other people and loving God. So with those goals and with that vision, you'll be able to do all the things that you're hoping to do with the team around you and be the Christian leader you're hoping to be, not just that business person who cracks the whip and does the thing, but instead being a leader that's there for their team and helping them with every aspect of their work and their lives. I think we underestimate how much our bosses, our coworkers impact our daily lives and the way we think about how our life is going. So being that Christian leader will help you be the influence that everyone around us needs, that stability and that love that everyone is looking for right now. So my challenge to you is come up with one way that you can be that Christ-like leader this week. Is there a way that you can put away the ego, the fear and the pride, and instead look at them as a blessed, loved individual of God and help them in a way that Jesus would have helped them? All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and tell a friend. If there's ever a time you want someone to speak at your Bible study or at your church, probably remotely, unless you live in my town let me know. And you can reach me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'm happy to hear from you, pray for you, or talk about something you're interested in hearing about. And remember, being a Christian leader in the path that Jesus took starts with small steps.